Ladies and gentlemen, as pointed out previously, the communists can never hope to come to power over the entire United States through a so-called national liberation of a minority population. They can capture a large portion of it, and they can create an awful lot of chaos and destruction everywhere else. But to take the country as a whole will require an entirely different approach. The violent revolution becomes of primary value to the communists to the extent to which it can be used to condition the masses psychologically to accept the non-violent revolution, which is offered supposedly as the only alternative. Hoping to avoid further violence and bloodshed, the public is to be pressured into accepting measures that will move the country gradually and legally toward communism, but without calling it that. The strategy of the proletarian revolution calls for the quiet conversion of our government into a communist regime, but under the banner of socialism. Well, what is socialism? All right, let's define it. According to the dictionary, socialism is a political concept based upon the principle of government ownership and control of property, the means of production, and the avenues of commerce. But the important thing, as far as this presentation is concerned, is how do the communists define it? And this is where many people are surprised to learn that the communists have an entirely different meaning for the word socialism than the average American has. Did you know that there isn't a single communist country in existence anywhere on earth? That's right, not one. Russia isn't a communist country. Red China isn't. Cuba certainly isn't. These are socialist lands. That's how communist leaders always describe them. You see, according to the teachings of Karl Marx, communism will come to this world only in some future utopian era, when men will have learned to live together in perfect harmony, when they'll no longer be greedy or competitive, when they'll want to share equally with their fellow human beings and have nothing better than anyone else. When this comes to pass, there'll no longer be any need for police or for government of any kind. And then he said, the state will wither away. When that happens, said Marx, it will be communism. In the meantime, comrades, whenever we come to power, we shall call it socialism. So the next time you hear a communist spokesman stand before a college audience or a TV camera, and say innocently that all the communists are doing here in America is working for socialism, you must understand what he means by that word. What he's really saying is all the communists are doing is trying to bring to America exactly the same thing they now have in the Soviet Union and Red China. <laughs> now they can call that socialism if they want to, but most Americans, I think, would describe that over there as communism. The uh, new program of the Communist Party on this subject has this to say. The term socialism describes but the first stage of a new society that in its full development is called communism. Socialism is a transitional stage. Well, the important question though is why do the communists promote socialism? Is it merely because they honestly believe that it's a necessary transitional stage to some higher, more perfect form of society? I don't think so. I doubt very much if the communist leaders believe their own fairy tale. And I'm sure they're not so naive as to believe that their present super state is ever really going to wither away. But they promote socialism just the same because they know that socialism by definition means control over people. If the government owns and controls all property, all means of production, and all avenues of commerce, then it controls all people. If we're dependent upon the government for our food, our clothing, our shelter, our jobs, our medical care, then we're far more effectively controlled by those who hold political power than if they stood over us with soldiers and weapons. Some years ago, I happened to attend a meeting where several anti-communist refugees from behind the Iron Curtain were called upon to relate their personal experiences. Some of the questions that came from the audience were rather naive, I suppose, because finally, one of the refugees spoke up and he said, you know, you Americans have funny ideas about life under communism. Apparently, you think there's a communist soldier standing on every street corner with a rifle and bayonet to keep the people in line. But this isn't so. 
He said, oh, sure, in the beginning there were plenty of soldiers and executions and deportations to slave labor camps, but we don't see much of that anymore. The open violence lasted only for about a year or a year and a half, and then the anti-communist leadership was liquidated. And now to the casual observers, there's a great deal of apparent calm and freedom. For instance, he said, I lived in the largest city in the country. We had a large park there directly across the street from a beautiful church. He said they left one church open, one in the entire country, primarily for guided tours of visiting Americans who had come to see if religion was being persecuted. He said, theoretically, any time I wanted to, I could have gone into that park, stood on a bench, and spoken out against communism. Then I could have walked across the street into that church and knelt down in prayer, and I wouldn't have been arrested or bothered in any way. But you can be sure I did not do these things. Because if I had, the very next day, the wheels of the bureaucracy would have begun to turn, and I would have been informed that my quota of food stamps had been cut, that my allotment for clothing and shoes had been reduced, that my allocation for living quarters had been downgraded, and finally, that my job assignment had been changed from the kind of work for which I'd been trained to menial labor at lower pay. So none of us did any of those things that we were theoretically entitled to do because of the tremendous power that the Communist Party had over our economic existence. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He hesitated for a moment and weighing his words very carefully so as not to hurt our feelings, he said, you know, I came to America expecting to find a nation of free men. But instead, I find exactly the same thing. Everywhere I look, I see men and women who know that communists are making headway in this country. They know that something must be done and that someone must stand up to them. But they themselves do nothing. They remain silent because they're afraid that if they speak out or take a stand publicly, it'll be bad for business. They may lose a client. They may even lose their jobs. Or perhaps they're receiving a regular government check and already are too dependent upon some of the very people and programs they know they should oppose. And then he said, these men voluntarily have gone behind the Iron Curtain. They're already taken over by the communists. The only difference is that for the present at least, they can still get out any time they really want to, and we could not. I think there's a great lesson to be learned from that because it's true, isn't it? There are many men who are physically brave beyond any question when it comes to standing up against a tyranny that threatens with armies. Some of them carry the actual scars of battle to prove it. But when it comes to this new kind of war, they're lost to the fight. When there is no battlefield, when the weapons are not rifles or bombs, but economic pressures, then who is your enemy? How do you fight? Where do you begin? It's precisely for these reasons that any modern dictatorship must have control over the economic sphere of all human activity. This was true of Nazism, it was true of fascism, it's true of communism, and it's also true of socialism. Regardless of what name we give it, total government control is by definition totalitarianism. That's what the word means. Now, Leon Trotsky, as you recall, was one of the original Bolsheviks who led the communist revolution in Russia. In 1937, Trotsky wrote a book entitled The Revolution Betrayed. And in this book, here's what he said. The basis of bureaucratic rule is the poverty of society in objects of consumption. When there is enough goods in a store, the purchasers can come whenever they want to. When there is little goods, the purchasers are compelled to stand in line. When the lines are very long, it's necessary to appoint a policeman to keep order. Such is the starting point of the power of the Soviet bureaucracy. It knows who is to get something and who has to wait. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no better description than that of why the communists work to promote 
socialism. No matter whose definition you use, under socialism, those who run the government and the communists are confident that in America they eventually will be the ones who do so. Those who run the government will know who is to get something and who has to wait. And that represents control over human beings. What has all this to do with the communist revolution in America? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has everything to do with it because the building of socialism is the communist revolution in America. It represents the process whereby our country can be moved gradually toward communism without the people even being aware of it. No matter what grievance we may have, real or imagined, no matter what national problems we may face, the communists seize upon these as excuses to build socialism. They have one and only one solution for all problems. More government, more government, and then more and more until it's total government. And forgive me for saying it one more time, total government is communism. Again, let's turn to the record. Shortly after the Watts riot in 1965, the Communist Party brought out this pamphlet entitled, The Watts Upsurge, a Communist Appraisal. And here is what it said. The challenge of the Watts explosion can be met only by a truly massive program a vast increase in the investments in the War Against Poverty program. What is called for is not only a total economic opportunity program for wiping out unemployment and for proper job training, but a program for the total reconstruction of the area. Now, the People's World, the official West Coast newspaper of the Communist Party, in its August 28, 1965 issue, ran this rather interesting editorial. What is needed now is an effort that begins to approximate the magnitude of the problem. As a minimum, such a program should demand massive emergency action by the federal government. Well, then, six months later, after this particular article, the Communist Party came out with this. It's called the New Program of the Communist Party, but this was the first draft, published in 1966. And here's what it said. We favor full use of federal powers to achieve these objectives. Now, as I read this, uh, listen carefully to see if it doesn't sound familiar, perhaps like something you've heard from more respectable sources. Government assumption of responsibility for assuring a guaranteed annual wage. Complete cradle-to-the-grave social insurance coverage, including all medical care. Equal educational opportunities for all, with acceptance of the principle of student stipends. A national reconstruction plan to end ghettos and slums and provide the nation with a modern rapid transit system operated as a public service. And passage of a National Youth Act that will ensure education, vocational training, and employment at decent wages for the younger generation. Does that sound familiar? Well. Ladies and gentlemen, if it reminds you somewhat of the Great Society, it's because it is the Great Society, lock, stock, and barrel. Gus Hall, head of the Communist Party, explained it this way. This is the January 24, 1965 issue of The Worker, and Gus Hall said, the communist attitude toward the Great Society can be summarized in an old saying that two men sleeping in the same bed can have different dreams. We communists support every measure of the great society concept because we dream of socialism. And when you recall what Gus Hall means when he says socialism, then you realize that the communists support the welfare programs of the great society, the New Deal, the New Frontier, or whatever they decide to call it in the future, because they dream of bringing communism to America through these programs. The next question of importance is, how do the communists promote socialism? Certainly it takes far more than a mere declaration of intent, more than writing a few books. How can they bring it off, especially when there are so few of them? How can they manipulate the vast majority into accepting socialism 
when they really don't want it? Well, here again we find that they have a plan. The strategy is precise and well tested. It's called revolutionary parliamentarianism. Now the general strategy employed is a political pincers movement, and these are the terms the communists use to describe it. A pincers movement applying political pressure from above and from below. Now, when they talk about pressure from above, they mean using their people and their influence within the very government marked for takeover to bring forward official recommendations for legislation. These come from the highest possible levels and carry the full prestige of the government itself. The recommendations, of course, are offered supposedly as solutions to national problems. But when passed into law, their only real effect is to vastly increase the power of government and to move the country that much closer toward the ultimate goal. The pressure from below, then, involves using their influence over the various mass membership organizations of the country to create the appearance of great popular support for these recommendations. Of course, the members of those organizations must never suspect that they're being used to promote the communist program. Now, the silent majority, the average person with no particular axe to grind, is caught right in the middle. He looks above and sees highly respected spokesmen for government calling for socialist legislation. He looks below and sees mobs of demonstrators shouting for the same thing. He says to himself, has everyone gone crazy or is it me? Now, he's still in the majority, of course, but he doesn't know it. He thinks he's helplessly outnumbered, and he bows to what he thinks is the democratic will of the majority. All that remains, then, is for the duly elected legislators to place their own careers and political expediency above the best interests of the nation, to yield to this political pressure and pass the legislation into law. Then the whole process starts all over again with new recommendations from above, new demands from below, and finally, new capitulation in the halls of Congress. In this way, the nation can move to the left in giant strides until the ultimate goal of communism itself is reached entirely legally through the constitutional process and in the name of the nation. Now, this government pamphlet entitled the new role of national legislative bodies in the communist conspiracy is a reprint of two chapters taken from a communist textbook used in Czechoslovakia. It was written by Jan Kozak, the historian and theoretician of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party. This is one of the manuals used to teach communist cadre how the tactic of revolutionary parliamentarianism was used successfully in Czechoslovakia and how it might be a applied to other countries as well. So, as I read this, even though Kozak is speaking of how they did it in Czechoslovakia, think in terms of how the same strategy might be used, or perhaps is being used, right here in America. Kozak said, the pressure from above successfully employed by our workers' class was the use made of the organs holding powers, the government, parliament, national committees, for bringing about a wide popularization of revolutionary demands and slogans. The fact that such demands and recommendations emanated directly from the highest state organs had a strong influence on their popularization. Whereas pressure from above is the pressure exerted by the organs of the state, pressure from below is the pressure exerted by the popular masses. The United Mass Organizations, which were led and influenced to a large extent by the communists, represented in this way the direct reserves of the party. All the old proven forms of the struggle were employed, calling of protest meetings, passing of resolutions, sending of delegations, organizing mass demonstrations, and also eventually using strikes, including general strikes. The pressure from below made it impossible for the other parties, which had numerical superiority, to isolate the communists and to stop the revolution. Thus, it made up for the numerical weakness of the revolutionary representatives. Progress toward socialism may take under these circumstances a democratic and constitutional course. All the changes which in their entirety represent a revolutionary transformation of the capitalist society into a socialist one 
will proceed absolutely legally and in the name of the nation. Is it possible, do you suppose, that revolutionary parliamentarianism is being used against America today? Is there any evidence of this kind of pressure from above? Well, ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do to answer that question is read some of the official reports and recommendations that have been pouring out in a steady stream for years from the bureaus, special agencies, and commissions of the federal government. Consider, for example, just those reports issued by the various President's Commissions, the President's Commission on Automation, the President's Commission on Crime, the President's Commission on Civil Rights, to name just a few. Now, this is perhaps the most classic recent example. It's the report of the President's National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, better known as the Kerner Report, released to the public in March of 1968. Have you read this? It's incredible. The list of recommendations supposedly to remove the causes of civil disorders in America reads almost identical to the new program of the Communist Party. And that's not much of an exaggeration either. It calls for the vast expansion of all welfare programs and agencies. It suggests absorbing all city, county, and state welfare programs into one gigantic federal welfare program. And why have state socialism when you can have national socialism? It calls for a, a government guaranteed minimum wage. It calls for federal financing and control of every conceivable sphere of human activity. Education, housing, transportation, even insurance policies. It calls for strict gun control laws and even recommends the creation of a national police force. Well, naturally, it doesn't call it that by name. It refers to it as the National Law Enforcement Center. But there's no doubt as to what its ultimate form will be especially since it's to operate in conjunction with the Defense Department. But the most incredible thing about this report, I think, is not the list of recommendations. That's almost expected from groups of this kind nowadays. The real shocker lies in its findings, the discoveries it made. Here was a body of men, highly respected, with the prestige and financial resources of the federal government at their disposal. Their task was to uncover all of the causes of civil disorders in our land, and to do so impartially with favor or malice to no one. Let the chips fall where they may. Now, would you suppose that the Communist Party played some tiny, microscopic role in the riots, the campus disorders, the assaults against police? Well, you're mistaken. Just because the leaders of these revolutionary movements carry the Viet Cong flag, pay homage to Che Guevara, travel frequently to Moscow and Peking, preach against capitalism, promote the building of socialism, follow the communist line without deviation, and move in perfect unison in every major city. That doesn't prove anything. According to the Kerner Report, the communists are playing absolutely no role at all in our nation's civil disorders. Look it up in the index. Here is a book with over 600 pages of fine print dealing with all of the causes of civil turmoil. And the words communism or communist aren't found even once. Not even to say that they looked into it and found it not to be an important factor, which is the expected cliche today. Apparently, the internal threat of communism is no longer even worth looking into. But what about the other half of the pincers? Is there any evidence of pressure from below? Well, consider the nature of such things as the mass action tactics of the Selma March of 1965, the various peace marches and civil rights marches held in almost every major city in the intervening years, the Poor People's Campaign and Resurrection City. What are these? Do they truly represent an expression of the majority of Americans, or are they merely well-organized pressure groups putting on an impressive show to create the illusion of vast popular support. And what effect does this have on Congress? Every time there's a new show of strength, doesn't Congress buckle under the political pressure and pass into law the recommendations previously made by some commission or agency of the federal government? And hasn't the silent majority been caught between these pincers 
And hasn't the country been taking giant strides to the left through our constitutional process and in the name of the nation? The entire process was best described, I think, by Martin Luther King. He wrote an article for Saturday Review, which appeared in the April 3rd, 1965 issue. And here is how he described it. The goal of the demonstrations in Selma, as elsewhere, is to dramatize the existence of injustice and to bring about the presence of justice by means of nonviolence. Long years of experience indicate to us that Negroes can achieve this goal when four things occur. One, nonviolent demonstrators go into the streets to exercise their constitutional rights. Two, racists resist by unleashing violence against them. Three, Americans of conscience, in the name of decency, demand federal intervention and legislation. And four, the administration under mass pressure initiates measures of immediate intervention and remedial legislation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a perfect description of how pressure from below is being used in America today to further the nonviolent proletarian revolution. You know, it always bothers me when I have to agree with the communists. It doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, I'll read something in the communist press that is 100% correct. It comes out in their favor even without their having to lie about it. And here's an example. In the People's World, the January 29, 1966 issue, the communists said, the problem is that the power structure that runs both of the old political parties seems to have great difficulty in comprehending what is taking place in the Negro freedom movement. They don't know a revolution when they see one. And all I can say to that is amen, they sure don't. They call it everything under the sun except a revolution. And they're the same people by and large who still tell you it can't happen here. Ladies and gentlemen, not only can it happen here, not only is it happening here, but it has been happening here for years. The problem is that most of us haven't been able to recognize a revolution in all of its forms when we saw one. Well, all right, so what do we do about it? What are the countermeasures that need to be taken? And where do we begin? We begin by knowing what not to do. Because if we do the wrong things, obviously that's worse than doing nothing at all. For example, as I'm sure everyone here is well aware, we must not be led into placing the blame for the riots, the civil disorders, on the Negro people of our nation. Even those few who are promoting hatred and violence in the black communities are not themselves the cause. They're merely being used by forces far bigger than they are to promote the violent phase of the revolution in America. Just as many white people are being used, I might add, by those same forces to promote the nonviolent phase. Secondly, and this too almost goes without saying, we mustn't resort to violence either as a means of furthering political or social goals. And we must do everything humanly possible to discourage others from doing so. Third, we must not be fooled into thinking that the causes of our civil turmoil are such things as poverty, poor housing, lack of education, and similar social or economic factors. As a matter of fact, most of today's self-styled revolutionaries, black and white, come from good homes, could earn better than average incomes if they wanted to work. And in fact, they're products of some of the finest institutions of higher learning. We shouldn't be indifferent to the social and economic conditions of those in need and we should do all we can within the concepts of economic and political freedom to improve those conditions. But let's not kid ourselves into thinking that these are the causes of our national problems today. Fourth, we must not look to the expansion of government and government programs as the solution. As I hope I've made it clear by now, this is exactly what the communists want us to do because it's the very process whereby they hope to come to power in this country through nonviolent means. These are the things we must not do. What then does that leave on the positive side? Well, first of all, and perhaps most obvious of all, 
we must support our local police. But that means a lot more than just putting a bumper sticker on the car. It means taking an active interest in civic affairs to ensure that the police aren't saddled with so-called civilian review boards. Nothing can be quite so damaging to police morale and efficiency as converting every arrest into a trial of the policeman instead of the criminal. To support your local police also means making sure they remain independent of control from Washington. And don't forget, whatever the federal government finances today, it shall control tomorrow. Next on the list, we must recapture the American faith in the free enterprise system. Capitalism has become almost a dirty word in some places, mainly because its defenders were busy enjoying the fruits of capitalism while its enemies were busy writing books and giving lectures. Consequently, capitalism has retreated steadily before the onslaught of socialism and now is struggling for its very existence. Young and old, we must become students again and study the theories of Madison and Jefferson, Bastiat and von Mises, just as intently as our enemies pursue the pages of Marx and Lenin, Galbraith and Keynes. Not only must we become grounded in theory, but we must become advocates and spokesmen as well. We must know what we stand for as well as what we oppose. Next, and this is probably the most difficult task of all, we must carry this message regarding the dual nature of communist revolution to our friends, our neighbors, our business associates, and everyone who will listen. Now this is hard by and large because people don't want to hear it. It's bad news. It spoils the party. But you know, I think it's about time we began to worry less about spoiling the party and more about preserving the system that makes the parties possible. And that means accepting our personal responsibility to do everything we humanly can do to carry the truth about civil turmoil to every man, woman, and child in America. Now, ladies and gentlemen, none of these proposals will produce results. And nothing else you may suggest will do so either unless and until we get right down to the heart of the problem, the life force of the revolution itself. We must discover the identity of those individuals, both above and below, who consciously are furthering the communist program for revolution and then remove them from their positions of trust and leadership. Anything less than that will be totally futile because we'll merely be running around trying to put out one or two fires over here while they're busy setting 10 new ones over there. Now, of course, the minute you begin to think along these lines, you'll become the target of a whole barrage of attacks. You'll be called a witch hunter, a McCarthyite, a right-wing extremist, and other delicate phrases that are well designed to intimidate the average person into silence. If that doesn't work, then you'll be called a fascist, or at least a dictator, because Supposedly, you want to deny basic constitutional freedoms to a small group of Americans just because they happen to hold political views that are different from yours. How many times have you heard that? And you know, at first it sounds almost convincing, but the argument is a trap. And the bait inside that trap is the hidden assertion that the Communist Party is merely a political party. Now, if it were a political party, and that's all, then of course, we would have to grant them all the same constitutional rights and immunities as other loyal American citizens. But if the Communist Party is not a political party, if it is, in fact, a supranational organization dedicated to world conquest, if in addition to political means, it also uses military means, economic means, propaganda means, bribery, blackmail, treason, murder, and any other means that suit its purposes, then its members are not political by nature, are not loyal to the United States, and have no legal or moral claim to constitutional liberties. There's no such thing as absolute freedom. For every liberty, an equal and opposite restraint is required. For example, in order for us to enjoy freedom of speech, it's necessary to deny others 
the freedom to come in here and break up this meeting. The logic of liberty is that it must stop short of the liberty to destroy itself. And if we're to preserve the freedoms we cherish in this land, then we mustn't be tricked by clever propagandists into giving the Communist Party the freedom it seeks to destroy freedom for us all. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close this presentation with two observations that I know you may not want to hear, but they must be made nevertheless. The first is that this struggle in which we're now engaged, in a very real sense, is more deadly than war. Call it what you will, Cold War, revolution, struggle, whatever. The present stakes are higher than in any other war we've ever known. After all, why do we dread war? Well, there are three reasons. Death, destruction, and human suffering. But ladies and gentlemen, if communism should ever come to America, we'll face more death, destruction, and human suffering than any people in history has ever faced at the hands of their invading conquerors. And it would make no difference whether the road to communism were traveled violently or non-violently. The so-called expropriation of the capitalists that would lie at the end of that road would constitute one of the greatest bloodbaths of history. Now, the second observation is related to the first. It is simply that we have now passed the point of painless solutions and parlor patriotism. There was a time, and not too long ago, I think, when we could have pulled ourselves out of this without too great a sacrifice on the part of anyone. All that would have been necessary would have been for us to take an interest in the domestic affairs of our nation and to insist that our elected representatives merely enforce the laws that were then on the books to protect us from internal subversion and to keep the enemy outside the gates. But we didn't. Instead, we slept. And one by one, those laws were stricken down by the Supreme Court. Congress failed to repair the damage. And our defenses are no more. Now the enemy is inside our gates. He is on our streets. He is in our halls of parliament. And now there is hell to pay. Our enemy is not going to leave quietly just because we suddenly discover him and ask him to go. Hardly. The nature of tyranny is such that, like the barb on an arrow, it goes in easily. But the price of pulling it out is a piece of flesh. Now, let me be more specific. Before we finally win this battle, and I should hasten to say that there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to win. I'm increasingly convinced of this. But before we finally do see victory, it's now inevitable that some of us, even in this room, will lose our lives in the communist revolution that already is raging around us. I can't tell you who it's going to be, of course. But I can tell you that it'll make no practical difference whether we're resisting at the time or whether we're merely trying to hide. Most of the casualties will occur because people just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, I mention this not to suggest that we all grab our guns and groceries and head to the hills. In many ways, this too would be playing right into the hands of the communists. No, I mention it for only one reason, and that is to stress the seriousness of the challenge that now confronts this nation. It's literally a question of life and death for all of us. And it's about time the American people began to face up to that fact and to act accordingly. I have no idea of what each of you is going to do in the critical days that lie ahead. It may be much. It may be little. It may be nothing at all. I don't know. Only you can answer that question. But ladies and gentlemen, whatever it is you decide to do for your country, do it soon. Do it now. Every minute that you delay further, 
will add dearly to the price of ultimate victory. Thank you.